do you feel distressed in your life? Do you kind of feel like your life is falling apart? Well, let's take that a step further. What if your life is falling apart because of something you actually did? Something that's nobody's fault but your own. What do you do? What does God do? Join us today as we see in Psalm chapter 3 that no matter what David ever did in his life, God never walked away from him. Today in our psalm series, today we're going to work through a, a very short psalm, but it's a very powerful psalm. It's one that King David wrote. And when he wrote it, he was actually in complete distress. His life was falling apart, a lot of it due to his, his very own actions. But nonetheless, David's life was forever being changed. So what we learned today is that no matter what David did, whatever he got himself into, whatever happened, this psalm was a prayer to God. It was his cry to God. It was a thankful prayer that even when David messed up so much in his life, he learned that God was still there for him. And some of you need to really know that today. You've done something in your life and you're like, ah, I've just ruined everything. And yet God's saying, I'm, I'm right there. I'm going to be there for you. Here's an illustration. For those of you who remember President Nixon, uh, what we remember most is his involvement in the Watergate scandal. The morning of June 17, 1972, several burglars were arrested in the office of the Democratic National Committee, located in Watergate complex of buildings in Washington, D.C. This was no ordinary robbery because these burglars were connected to President Richard Nixon's re-election campaign. He had been caught wiretapping phones and stealing documents. These were the people that worked for Nixon. Nixon took aggressive steps to cover up the crimes, but then Washington Post reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, they revealed his role in the conspiracy and President Nixon resigned on August 9th, 1974. I want you to imagine this, the President of the United States, the man that everyone looked up to and trusted, had this huge fall. He once had been living in the White House with, surrounded by Secret Service. He was the most powerful man in the United States, calling the shots and dealing with world leaders. He had planes and helicopters and private retreats at his beck and call. But with one really bad decision, one really stupid idea that he came up with, he had to resign. And he had a stain on his name that lasted the rest of his life and even to today. Disgrace and scandal followed him. That story might put today's psalm in a little bit of perspective because that's kind of a lot of what happened to King David. King David was the beloved king, or like president, of Israel. He was a man after God's own heart. He was a warrior. He was the man who killed Goliath. Here was a man who wrote psalms. He, he sang songs. He played the harp. A man who was a shepherd. A man who God called to be king of Israel. A king who, who his descendant would be Jesus. Everything was going away, the way it should be. Everything was going his way until one day it didn't. This is the backdrop for the psalm. The moment when David decided to not go to war with his men, but instead he decided to stay home from the battlefield. Maybe at this point he felt like he was getting too old. Maybe he just felt like he needed a break. But whatever the reason, it was a really, really bad choice. And looking out his window as he was home, he saw a woman, a beautiful woman, bathing on her rooftop. He called for her. His servants warned him, David, don't do this. This is the wife 
of Uriah, the wife of someone who's, who's being a soldier for you, that's, that's on the, the battlefield for you. David, don't do this. But David's lust and his desire and, and his you know, arrogance pretty much won out. He had an affair with this beautiful woman, Bathsheba. To make a long story short, most of us know she gets pregnant. David makes sure that her husband is put on the front lines and is killed so he can have her. And from that moment on, David's life was forever changed. The prophet Nathan confronts David with these words. 2 Samuel 12, 9 says this, Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Here's his consequences. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly. But I will do these, this thing before all Israel, before the sun. And that is exactly what happened. David's house from that moment on was a disaster. Of course, the baby that, that, that Bathsheba had, had conceived died. Uh, David's oldest son, Amnon, raped his half-sister, Tamar. Tamar's brother, Absalom, took revenge by murdering Amnon. These were all like sons of King David. Absalom was the super hot son of David with the long flowing black hair. But because he murdered his, his half-brother, Absalom had to flee and go into exile for several years. Once he returned, David refused to see him for two years. The anger and the resentment were building in Absalom. And so one day, Absalom decided he should be king. So he begins this little campaign of his own. His goal was to take down his father. He would do everything he could from here on out to take the throne away from his dad. And it wouldn't be too difficult. Because just like Nixon had a, a bad name at this point, I think David's name was kind of like that. I bet the gossip spread like wildfire about David and Bathsheba and their baby and what David did to her poor husband. They knew that the baby Bathsheba was carrying was from an adulterous affair. David's house was falling apart. And he did it. It was all happening because of something he did. It was his fault. At this time, this was a great moment for his gorgeous son, Absalom, to try and step in and remove his dad from being king. His goal was to replace him. And that is what exactly happened. What Absalom did is he went and he found all the disgruntled people in Israel to side with him. He told the people, I care more about your problems than my dad does. And his plan worked. When David realized that this was happening, it was too late. He knew that Absalom's army was coming towards Jerusalem, and, and he knew that his family and those living in Jerusalem would be caught in the crossfire. So David didn't want that to happen. He voluntarily took his family and friends and left. He left Jerusalem. He left his throne in shame. The people were so disappointed in him that one man literally threw rocks at David as David was passing by, leaving Jerusalem. This would be David's lowest point in his life. His son turned on him. His son betrayed him, took his throne away from him. His son would literally have sex with David's concubines on the roof so everybody in Israel knew that Absalom was in charge. David's life was unraveling. For some of you, you get this. Your life is falling apart too. Maybe your wife left you because you had the affair. Maybe your husband left you because you had the affair. Maybe your kids now want nothing to do with you and your house is divided and there's turmoil everywhere all because of something you did. 
Because of this, your friends really want nothing to do with you either. And you can feel a small portion of what King David felt. But for many people, what they turn to is alcohol, drugs, maybe more affairs, maybe an addiction to whatever. Because they don't know how to handle this. But for David, he didn't turn to any of those things. He turned to God. And he wrote this psalm. This psalm is a prayer. Look at Psalms 3, verse 1. It actually says Psalms 3, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. This is when David is writing this. O Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise against me. Many are they who say to me, there is no help for him in God. Selah. David was a mess. And sometimes when we're a mess, the only thing we can do is pour our heart out to God. The great thing about David is he wasn't angry with God. He wasn't even bitter. He wasn't like, how could you let this happen to me? Because he knew it was really his fault. So what he did was he prayed. God, so many men are against me. Now, David wasn't telling this to God because God didn't know. David knew that God knew what was going on, but this was just David pouring out his heart to God. But I think the worst part for David was this idea that people thought that God would not help him. Look back at verse 2. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. That somehow maybe God would not come through for him all because of what he did and it, with his affair with Bathsheba. But the interesting thing is at this point of the story, David had already recognized his sin. David had already repented from it. He agonized over it and God forgave him. But here's what we need to remember, that just because we're forgiven and we repent, there's still consequences to the, the wake we left behind us. So when he heard that people were saying God would not help him, I think in a sense that really hurt him deeply because he knew his God. He knew his God was a very forgiving, loving God. Now, Selah in that particular uh, verse, um, it, it when you see that in Psalms, it usually is a, uh, it, it most likely is, there's a couple different options here, but it's most likely because this is all set to music, a musical notation, meaning like pause or crescendo. So kind of like this was a really important part that, that was in this Psalm. Like you can just imagine the music going loud as, as this was sung. Now, I love this verse because this next verse here, it, it shifts our focus from fear to trust. The next verse we read is going to actually, we're going to see David go from, God, all these people are after me. What am I going to do? They're saying all these bad things. And then he moves it upward. He moves his, his prayer upward. And, and it's a verse that I like to quote when I feel down or when I feel depressed. Because we all wake up with those days going, I just feel sad today. I feel fearful today. Maybe it's that bill, that meeting, that court, that doctor appointment. Here it is, verse 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. My head is down. I'm so sad. God comes along and just lifts it right up. He says, no, no, no. You don't have to be sad. I love this about a shield. God is my protector, my defender, my shield. I want you to think of a, of a big shield that someone's holding in front of you. God is doing that. He's your protector. I trust him. I trust him to do things I can't. I trust him to lift my head up. When I'm down, all I have to do is really just change my focus. And remember this. He's with me. He has a purpose. He will lead me and guide me. And when I turn my focus from my problem to him, he just lifts up my head. I'm looking up now. He's giving me my joy back. It's just this really beautiful visual. Verse 4 says, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill, Selah. For David, God's holy hill, Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And at this point, that was where the Ark of the Covenant was. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was, was a reminder to the Israelites of God's presence. 
It, it was something that was built all the way back in the days of Moses. And, and this was where God's presence was. And so wherever the ark was, it was as if God's presence was there. But as David was leaving Jerusalem, Zadok and the Levites, they were carrying the ark to, to, to join David in his escape. But David sent them back to the city. Look at this in 2 Samuel 15. Return the ark of God to the city. Here's why. If I find favor in the sight of the Lord, then he will bring me back again and show me both it and his habitation. But if he should say thus, I have no delight in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me as it seems good to him. I love this about David. I, I, he just trusted God with his life. Everything was falling apart. And he's like, you know what, God? Here's the deal. You do what you deem best for me and my life. He trusted God would do right. If it, he would either allow him back on the throne or he wouldn't. But David would be okay no matter what. That's the biggest part of learning to trust God. Saying, God, I don't like this, but I'm going to trust you. This is the place you have for me right now. And some of you, it's not a good place. You want to be pregnant and you can't get pregnant. You want a job, you can't get a job. You want to feel better, you don't feel better. All of these things, you, you just, you want healing. You, there's all these things we want in our life. David wanted to be back on his throne, but he, he really surrendered to God and said, you know what, God, here's the deal. Whatever you want from me, I'm good with. My life is in his hands. And I think that's a really, really great point to get to. And I think it's a life-changing point to get to. When we can actually say, God, my life is yours. I trust you with it. Whatever you want, I'm fine with. Because when we get to the point of trusting God for our entire life, then we can do this. And it's amazing that David says this next verse while everyone's chasing him and trying to kill him. Verse 5 says, I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. I, I put this picture on the background today because I want you to see that most of the time our life feels like this. Lightning storms, uh, oceans raging, like we just feel like, it, like life is just overwhelming to us. And yet what we have is a lighthouse. A lighthouse. And when I saw this picture, it was like, this is what it reminded me of God. A lighthouse is, is a place for, for, for like safety to, to show you, you know, what's around you, like a light in the midst of the darkness. Verse 5, I laid down and I slept and awoke for what? The Lord sustained me. David got to this point because of this. Verse 6, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. He's not going to be afraid. Why? Because he's learned to trust God. He really, really understands that God is so powerful. He can heal. He can get you the job. He can restore your marriage. He can make sure you get pregnant. He can do all of those things. He knows for David himself that God can destroy all of his enemies. And so therefore, David's like, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm just going to trust you, God. Because he's learned that. He's learned that God is really, really powerful and can wipe out his enemies anytime he wants. I kind of get this. The older I get, I don't know if it's just a getting older thing or if it's just a more following Jesus thing. I don't know. But I'm not really afraid much anymore. It's really weird. I, I see life so differently as I get older. I recognize that God has given me a certain number of days to be here on this earth. If someone hurts me, if someone slanders me, if someone's after me, or if someone says something mean about me, it's not going to matter. It doesn't matter in a month. It doesn't matter a year. It doesn't even matter forever. The only thing I realize now is that what matters is what God thinks of me. And I think that's the point that David has finally got to. It's really interesting. The older I get, it's amazing how I care less and less for what people think and really more and more about what God thinks. And for me, it, let's take that to the extreme. If someone kills me, I don't know. I know where I'm going. I know I'll spend eternity in heaven with God. So I don't worry about it. And I think David was at that place. I think he knew that God gave him a certain number of days to, to be king, to be on the throne, to be on this earth. 
And you know what? David knew if he died, if his son killed him, if something happened, I don't know. He felt secure knowing where he would go after he died. I have learned to focus on him and really not what could happen to me. And when you get to that point, with that comes peace, lying down in peace without fear. We see this in the New Testament with Peter. He's arrested. He's seen Jesus be crucified months earlier in a town where crucifixion was a thing. He didn't know what his future held, but here's the deal. He did know who held his future. So in prison, in prison, he could be hung on a cross and crucified, but he wasn't anxious. And we know that because you know what he did? He did what David did. He slept. Look at Acts 12, 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. When Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was what? Sleeping. He wasn't anxious. He wasn't worried. He was sleeping. Bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Peter's sleeping. And, and it's, it is this great example that, that God will move heaven and earth to save you out of something if in fact that's his plan. And that was his plan for Peter. God was not done with Peter yet. So God sends an angel all the way down to this prison to get Peter out. Look at verse 7. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him uh, and light shone in the prison and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. He said to him, put on your garments and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel, and he delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. He just knew that if God really needed him out of that situation, that he was powerful enough to do it. And David seems to know this too. He saw it all through his life. He saw how God came through for him as a young boy with, with just you know, a sling and five little stones up against a giant. He knew it because Saul, King Saul, had been chasing him for years and over and over God saved him miraculously. David knew God could do anything. And I think that's a lesson for us today. When we get to the point where we can know God so deeply and really honestly believe that he has our best interests at heart, when we really understand that our job is to live for him, then we can always trust him. God, I just trust you to do what needs to be done. But here's the deal, and you need to really grasp this because there's a lot of you that need to know that sometimes he doesn't rescue you. Sometimes he doesn't keep you from that pain or that harm. Sometimes you don't get pregnant. Sometimes you don't get the job. Sometimes you never get healed. But what that means is that God has a different plan for your life. Maybe he's doing something completely different. But we do know that the rest of the Bible says that God causes all things to work together for good. For those who are followers of Jesus, those who love God, God always has a purpose for good things and bad things, and we can rest on that. I was thinking about this with our guest speakers. Think about Jennifer Rothschild. Like, she still went blind. She prayed that she wouldn't. She asked God to heal her, and still to this day, she is still blind. But God is using her in mighty ways. We look at Kevin Ramsby, cuckoo crazy drug addict, broke into his house, stabbed him over 30 times. God didn't protect him from that. Gracia Burnham, kidnapped, she and her husband, uh, they kidnapped by terrorists. They were on the run for their life for a year, and the day that they were rescued, her husband dies. You're like, what? But God, why didn't you rescue them? Why didn't you heal her blind eyes? Why didn't you stop that crazy drug addict? But you know what the cool part about all of these people are? And this is a lesson for us. They let God use their heartaches and hurt to further his story in this world. 
And we've had them all as guest speakers. And the reason why is because they never ran away from God and didn't get mad at him. They said, you know what, God? I'm going to, I always say, bloom where you're planted, right where you're at. Verse 7 says, Arise, O Lord, save me. O oh my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. David makes a really great point. One plus God is always the majority. No matter how many tens of thousands of people that were after David, God, David knew that if he had just God on his side, that's all he needed. That's a really good reminder to all of us. I love it when, when Peter cuts off the ear of the soldier who was arresting Jesus before he went to the cross. And I love what Jesus says, Matthew 26, 52. But Jesus said, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. And then he says, do you not think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels. Jesus is saying, at one word, I can call on God and 72,000 angels will be right here. That is an enormous, powerful picture of what God can do. And David ends here, verse 8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people, Selah. David's final exclamation is salvation belongs to the Lord. And it shows that, that David is not depending on anyone else to save his life. He's not depending on his men, his warriors, his soldiers, anyone, counselors, nobody. He wasn't depending on a military strategy. Instead, he knows this, any victory would come from God alone. See, when we cast ourselves on God for deliverance, what happens next is when he delivers us, he gets all the praise. We can never, ever take praise for anything that God does for us. It's all about him. David's final request was, your blessing be upon your people. It's a reminder that these people in Israel who were following David out of Jerusalem, these people, David's like, please bless them. Please take care of them. And I think it all goes back to David knew that all of his people that were following him out of Jerusalem were doing so because of his own personal sin. David knew how his sin with Bathsheba and, and how killing her husband Uriah had caused the nation, the people, so much hardship. He knew that it was his son, Absalom. It was his son and, and, and the sword never departing from his, his household because of what he did with Bathsheba that was affecting the entire nation. So when God asked, or when David asked God to deliver him, he saw it in terms of God blessing his people. God bless the people. For us, I think it teaches us this, that we need to turn our pain into praise. Whatever pain you're going through, turn it to praise. God, I know you're going to use this. God, please use this. God, bless this situation, even though it seems so bad. That's what David did, but also we need to remember this. We need to use our worst trials to deepen our trust in him so that we can encourage his people all around us. Our deepest trials, like Jennifer Rothschild or, or, or uh, Kevin Ramsby or Gracia Burnham, our deepest trial, if we could learn how to turn those around and say, God, use this for your glory, I think that is our lesson from Psalm 3. Have a really good day.